You're listening. So, you're listening to Wolf Spirit Radio. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This is Jessica Ariel Morocco, and here at Answers from the Universe. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, JP, for joining us as well and being a part of it. Um, we're going to be doing a one-hour show today, and as you can tell, I have a slight cold, so please forgive me. It doesn't sound very well, as uh, <laughs> even with the microphone added to it, <laughs> microphone issues I've had. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, for for the most part, it's been very rainy out here, out here in Massachusetts, and uh, just trying to sort through everything and still working with the transmissions from Andromeda. Um, things that have been going on, you know, fortunately nothing really horrible that we know of has happened from CERN. And uh, we are, you know, s- still hopeful for the planet in many different ways. Um, I continue to channel this information. I think my gut instinct is that down in, in the future that it may give us some insight as to who are some of the players and some of the information that we have not considered in the past, which will possibly open the door to the future in helping us to be a peace in our present time. So, without further ado, I just would like to bring on JP. Hi, JP. Hello, hello. How are you? Doing okay. Like you said, a little under the water. Underwater, <laughs> yeah. Poor love. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, no, it's raining really, in, my, yeah, it's raining re- in my car today. Uh, yeah, you know, yesterday. Oh. <laughs> well, let's hope it's not raining too hard in your heart, uh, that it's just in the car, and you know, you're doing this underwater driving job. I think is an <laughs> admirable thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I said a go leaky ahead. windshield. It was a le- leaky windshield for the third time. I had to go to the same company, and uh, you know, try it again, and hopefully, I could be a little dry when I'm driving the next rainstorm. <laughs> <laughs> which left me with the cold. Indeed, indeed. And uh, talking about underwater, I have to say that the Dow Jones has really did dip down today. Um, it's uh, minus 97 points, which is quite a big jump. Uh, and what it, was the reason, I wonder? Well, you know, um, who knows? There's all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, there's all sorts of things that have been going on the last few days in, in astrologically, astronomically, and uh, earthwise, and all of these things are going on. So, um, and and of course, you know, the, the stock markets used to be. I don't think they are anymore, but they used to be an indicator of the mood of the world. If the mood's feel, if the world's feeling confident, then the stock market goes up. And when the world is feeling, you know, um, beleaguered or, or depleted, then it will go down. That's used to be how it was, but now it's how the AI are feeling. <laughs> it's like how, yeah. how the computers are feeling like. And, and uh, you know, this could be the beginning of the Matrix, you know, when the machines took over and enslaved humanity. That's really what the, the Matrix is looking at. That's what the new world, old, new world order looks like. We might not be in toilets, but we might as well be. Right. Mm. And I think, you know, like I said before, and early on in the first the beginning transmissions of Andronicus from Andromeda, he talked about the One World Order, that they had already suffered through that. Yes. And it was mostly mind control, predominantly mind control, what they were able to pull out of it. And uh, he had a very uh, strong uh, focus that he was able to see beyond it. But... Um, I don't believe we have to go through this. We really don't. We're getting educated. There's information all over the Internet. We were talking about how the Internet is still free and available to many. People can access whatever they want to learn about, albeit it will be have a, a, a bias to it. But um, also, I, th- I thought about how crucial the connection is between the U.S. and Europe uh, as to what's going on. And we seem to be working together and sharing information and actually observing our own governments and seeing what's going on from another perspective through the eyes of uh, Europe. 
and so and pro- possibly likewise you know maybe uh, the UK and some other nations are seeing their nation through our eyes as well and many others so um, you know I need I believe we need to continue to disseminate information to help people be aware of things um, any types of usage of microchips uh, please do not allow any type of system to convince you to insert a microchip chip into your system, whether it's under your skin as a tattoo or or anywhere on you, which would identify you as a number. And, um, you know, Andronicus talks about this. Some people that talk about this in the Bible, um, you know, having the mark of the beast or whatever. I don't know. There's many different interpretations. But either way, I mean, whether it's a re- for religious reasons or not, I think it's for freedom reasons. Just that you should not you should be independent and free thinking and not be controlled by any system as soon as you um, engage with any type of a uh, bot or any type of object that is is uh, mechanical uh, there's is a strong um, uh, you know I, I believe you're just uh, getting rid of your free will you know, you will be bombarded by ideas and, and other things that are not yours. And, and I believe this is already happening even without any kind of chip. But uh, just, you know, it's, it's just just my thought. And then maybe some of this stuff can be um, controlled. At least we can work through things, think, think past things, you know. Uh, if they want to take over, JP, you know, if they want to take over with everything being a uh, robotic, and you know eliminate the human workforce or eliminate you know I, to some degree that can happen but I think you know the natural way of doing things is people are, will just gravitate toward you know what feels more organic and they'll pull away from it but if they're mind controlled they won't have that ability what are your thoughts and it's very interesting because you know I have all my life interacted with uh, electronics and um and machinery and and computers and things like that um and you know at the at the same time i'm working on my own organic wetware and organic technology that is just you know the more i realize you know the more actually the more i look at electronics i see how crude and basic it is compared with the fine um, you know, it's like looking at a Casio digital watch compared with a fine uh, Swiss watch. Mm-hmm. You know, one is just kind of thrown together out of bits, and this, ah, there you go. Uh, and this other one is made with great care and precision, and and um, and uh, you know, very fine uh, attention. That's the word. And really, that's the difference between a thing that is made by machines and the thing that was made by humans bless your heart and lungs um uh, that it is the attention time space that goes into making something mm-hmm. that makes something of value of truly value i mean you're looking at the uh uh what's that book um zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance and um uh, what he's talking about is quality. You know, what does quality mean? And really, it comes down to how much attention somebody has spent putting, you know, making that article, you know. And, uh, you know, I made a, a, a little artifact for my girlfriend last week. Uh, and I spent days and days on the case, you know, the thing that it was in, and polishing it and sanding it and, you know, really working it. Um, and... You know, the electronics, well, the electronics part of it, to actually make it took about a quarter, one-fifth of the time to make the the, the, the wooden part. Um, And so, you know, what I'm trying to do is to establish the correct relationship between machine and organic. Yes. Um, I I don't doubt that. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think, and I'm not in agreement with let's eliminate everything electronic. I believe that the future is a combination of both. However, the part where 
we're eliminating um, common sense, that we're relying on everything to think for us, um, that's when we get in trouble. But to enhance what we already have is is wonderful. But like I said, to mess around with your own uh, physiology and um, what the inner workings of the brain, um, it's it's such a gift to have uh, the ability to think freely, to um, expand your your thoughts, and to create things, create things like you're talking about, JP. Well, it's, it's interesting, you know. Uh, what well, you're talking about, uh, you know, in, in relationship to Andronicus specifically, mm-hmm. you know, we came across him in some kind of prison situation or in some sort of captive situation, you know, sending out a signal, is there anybody out there? And um, and we see him going through. I mean, they use technology. They've got spaceships and stuff. You know, they got tin can well, spaceships. They don't, they're yeah, not walking around in Merca bars. No, so, they're not. You know, this is very still f- what we call 3D spaceships and stuff. <laughs> you know, probably. Yeah. He actually talks about that because I asked that question. Hmm. You'll see in, in the transmission. We're going to talk about that because they do use technology. Oh. And he explains why. Oh. It's funny because we're right on target with where we're headed. Interesting, interesting. Because you know, I've been, um, uh, you know, I'm a fan of Doctor Who. Do you, uh, you aware of Doctor Who? I'm aware of it. I never really got to watch the series, and I'm kind of glad that some of the stuff, Mm. I'm, you know, on on occasion I'll watch it, but it's like after the fact. It's it's so I don't feel like I'm being influenced. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. One the 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 Doctor himself, right? He's called the Doctor. That's his name, the Doctor. Um, and uh, he uh, has no weapons except for one thing, um, which is what's known as a sonic screwdriver. He calls it a sonic screwdriver, and um, you know, and, and it was just like too, too. Uh, you know, they wanted to have something that sounded high tech, and yet was also grounded. You know, it's like a screwdriver. Everybody knows what a screwdriver is, but what's a sonic screwdriver? Um, and it turns out to be a device that can send vibrations through through the local area, and um, vibrations at any frequency. Of of course, that can be light, it can be sound, it can be frequency. You know, you know all sorts of things. And and indeed, uh, it will undo screws if you use the right frequency. But basically, it's a general purpose frequency device, a sort of micro harp uh, mm-hmm. kind of thing. And um, so. The idea of building something like that has always fascinated me. You know, just as a, you know, every kid, every British kid wants a sonic screwdriver, of course. You know, everybody who's watched that show wants a sonic screwdriver because it's really handy. It's like a remote control, but for anything. And mm-hmm. it can undo screws and open locks. And op- and that the main thing he uses it for is for opening doors. It's the open sesame. It's the device that gets... You know, it's it's a it's a theatrical device, uh-huh. um, and uh, it's the piece of technology that he has that allows him to open doors, and that's the the thing that the doctor can do. He can it's open very, doors. It's, it's Isn't that interesting? James, yeah, it's like a James Bond type of thing. Yeah, like you know. a Q device. You know, here, here you go, <laughs> Q. Oh yeah, here's here's a thing. It'll open a door for you. You know, even if it's locked. So, um, so that's it, huge. It, it does all of these things. It's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's what we need is to get through the doors. Mm-hmm. Uh, one way or another, you know, it makes sense. <laughs> but that's crucial. And, uh, yeah, True Magic Dottie in the uh, chat room, she's saying, I don't like the old guy playing Doctor Who. But it's interesting because the Doctor has been played successively since the 1960s. Um, mm-hmm. the, the original Doctor, the first ever Doctor, was really old. He was an old, crusty, min- mingy old guy. And he got younger and younger and more zany through the series. <laughs> and I actually thought that the best Doctor to then play the next Doctor would be Dan Radcliffe, Harry Potter. Oh, okay. Because it's the same th- role. Mm-hmm. You know, the Doctor finds himself, he's got a, a, a feminine partner. This time it's a machine. It's Well, it's not a machine, it's a box. It's his ship. It's a time. Right. It's a time spaceship called a TARDIS. Okay, now you know I go on about Doctor Who because it contains lots of models. 
of the space program and you know he meets all these aliens and even he's even got reptilian friends you know all the people that he's ever battled against become his friends in the end well yeah i mean that, that makes sense to me yeah it really does so yeah so when when she's saying i don't like the old guy so the uh, currently played by peter capaldi who is you know he's in his middle ages he's not young he's not he doesn't follow that sequence and um and you know i perfectly agree with you too and uh um, peter capaldi in uh his uh last incarnation on, on tv he was um he played the publicity uh officer of the prime minister uh sort of during the tony blair years uh, a guy called alistair campbell who you know in real life was the most abrasive nasty piece of work kind of guy you could meet um and and peter capaldi played him <laughs> so you so you see this um this uh this uh you see this uh um uh, character who's who's just like swear he just swears his way through the series and so he's playing the doctor it's like i can't i can't not hear him swearing as he's talking which is like quite funny because yeah and also the doctor is you know he's got a strong glaswegian accent um and uh yeah and so it's gotten really interesting in the last few days in the last few series because his arch enemy who has been has been known as the master um who you know in the past has looked like uh do you know leo zagami you see he looks very kind of uh uh you know the svengali like he you know goatee beard black hair you know tall handsome kind of guy anyway he's always you know and he's he's all about you know, you will obey me he's a you know hip hypnotizes people anyway so this time round um he's kind of regenerated because he's a time lord and they regenerate because that's another theatrical device they use to shift in a new actor <laughs> so the doctor regenerates and look he's got a new feel that's why he gets younger you see yeah um so anyway uh as he's moving through uh through uh uh time he now incarnates as a woman and um and uh, she's known as missy and played by Michelle Gomez, who is just one of the most brilliant actors uh, that, you know, that I, I, I've seen on TV in the last few years. Just, a, she's a brilliant comedian. Um, she's zany and off the wall and rather psycho looking. So <laughs> it's just really, <laughs> she's just brilliant as the master. And she calls herself Missy, like the mistress, you see. So she's that Missy. Um and uh so anyway um enough about my t favorite tv series but this is what's going on and 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 so what we're seeing you know we're now seeing him battling against the female and he doesn't usually because he battles with females at his side normally so think the you know the lines are getting blurred that's all very yes yeah, well that's that's what happens mm. you kind of get a little confused about why you're there and what the purpose is and and especially when you start looking at things from another perspective or you you know you could dislike someone and then find out that you were incarnated as that you know it's like people being racist or people having a prejudice even against the uh, reptilians you know exactly. how connected are they to us they're all a part of this universe well then they're, they're so a part we're of we're all us. learning yeah they are you know we have the r complex um i was watching a video the other night um talking that the lawyers have um the best lawyers these you know the, they have a book which is called the lizard um and it's apparently a very expensive book but it's all about how to control people using the reptilian mind you know mm -hmm. how do you appeal to the reptilian mind and you know um and he said you know just uh if you want to get somebody's attention you know just say boobies <laughs> you know, and, and you know everybody perks up you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's one way to do it <laughs> exactly so i think women would have to do it may say something else but yeah but you know even women are comforted by boobies everybody was a baby 
Yeah. You know, and um, it takes us back to that feeling, you know, so, you know, for men, <laughs> boobies, you know, because, you know, say that, that there's only th- a few things that a lizard wants, you know. Can I eat it? Can uh, Do I have to kill it? Or can I have sex with it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Eat kill or shag. Uh, yeah. Basically, and that, if you appeal to any of those, you get people's attention and you can persuade people. And that's what it's all about. And that's what the lizard is about. And that's what the top lawyers know. And that's why they're the top lawyers, because they know this stuff. Oh. That's interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, so. that's good. And then we know, we know about lawyers. <laughs> lawyers and lizards. Birds and lizards. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they do belong together, don't they? They do, don't they? So, shall we venture to... Over. <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, somewhere in a galaxy far, far away... <laughs> And apparently, long, you know, this is a, you know, this, he's now revealing to us that he's tunneling through time and space. Yes. Um, and coming and popping up at different junctures, isn't he? Yeah. So he's like sending you psychic postcards oh, from these different parts of his uh, adventure. Yeah, four pages long usually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like you're like a kind of um, pen pal. You know, like, like you know, uh, did you ever have pen pals in the in the past? In America, I uh, never really had one, but yeah. but um, you know what they are. You know, you you adopt a foreigner and you send letters to them. You know. Yeah. So um, here we go. So and very much like a pen pal, you know, he he starts off. Let's let's. Uh, so uh, here we go. The Andromeda Transmissions Part Seventeen. Greetings, my beloved friends. If only you knew how much I treasure you. It is your society that helps to liberate my people. We are in deep gratitude over your attunement to our struggles. I do, of course, recognize that your plight is similar to ours, yet beyond the stretch of time and space, we joyfully are connected. I spread my wings to brush your face with love. Though we have had many challenges, the vibrational unease of frequencies has dropped considerably since the Algebranians left. <laughs> I'm always happy when they leave. We have sur- surmised that they were the originators of this horrid mind control effort. I discovered that they were gifted with controls for offset their fragile physical structure. However, like any gift from source, it can be taken away. Zephron was a proving ground for this, and as the Vincala were sent away for this behavior, likewise so were the Aldebranians. Both have, both have lost most of their mind control ability around us. I do see that they have less of a presence on your planet until a great war, World War II with the Nazis. Somehow they were able to move forward in time to office, offset our interaction with you and almost destroyed your present society had it not been the timelines were off. They discovered my discourse with you and how I was able to get my people free from your assistance. With your assistance, presumably. They may have controlled your entire planet by now had we not disrupted their field. That will never happen now. Jess? I began to think about the Hunger Games, the plans of a one-world society. I wondered if it was Aldebaran who wanted to create this, and with the help of the Vincala's forceful approach and the Lucido's scientific mind, it may have been possible. The awareness of the Andromedans discovering the problem of the Aldebarans and then reporting it to the Vegas may have been what was necessary to prevent a World War III or even a successful Nazi takeover during World War II. It is hard to tell what the outcome would have been, Either way, somehow the timelines may have been altered to protect our current current civilization and future of mankind. Uh, uh, Oh, right, sorry, this is, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I know what you were thinking. We prevented something catastrophic to your civilization. 
You have too many on your planet now to create an exodus. We will be watchful of you always. If you are safe, will we be safe? Yes, we are your guardians in many ways. What happened to the Slitaran and the Catronians? Are they still there on Zephron? Yes, the Slitaran are moving along. They are slow with everything they do. I think they wanted to go underground, but have asked to move closer to Mars. I think they are actually going to Venus. That is what the Vegas said, but they would, do, but they would do. Oh, sorry. This is what the Vegas said, but they would do, but would not admit it. <laughs> sorry, sorry, there was a button. There. <laughs> there was I'm stumbling over. Let me just remove that button. There. All right. <laughs> that is what the Vegas said they would do, but would not admit it to us. There we go. This is this is their final outpost to grow. Then it will be decided what will happen after that. Though they did not cause the primary problems here, they did still need to evolve and have trouble getting along on a day-to-day -day basis with most species. The Sleetarin are strong-willed, hard-headed, difficult and unreasonable, yet essentially harmless. However, amongst others, their behavior stirs up greater issues and resentments. They will be alone for a while. We will see how they fare. The Ketronians are also a difficult bunch. They are strong-willed and dominant. We find them unreasonable, yet dangerous if it gets too out of control. They have great strength, intelligence, and a fierce attitude of dominance. Since they are cousins of the Vincala of the reptoid species, I feel they could be quite harmful. From what I see from this vantage point, they are in control of your system on Earth. However, it is being challenged by others in a way that I cannot see. The Ketronians are leaving, but I am not sure where. They placed a strange grid around them, and we can't seem to peer beyond it. Hmm. I need to look into what is going on. They are about to change or alter something. I'll be back. Meanwhile... Four days have passed. Four days pass. I can't tell you the upheaval we experienced. During the exodus of the Sleetarin, they began burning the Aldebranian buildings. They destroyed much of them before they could before they could go inside and investigate. Oh, before we could go inside and investigate. Yeah. yeah. Let's keep that up to date. Um, we are suspicious that they have information. We think the Ketronians blamed it on the Sleetarin and tried to detain them. A <laughs> false flag. I talked to the Vegas and they told me to allow the Slitarin to move along to their next outpost, and that's what we did. We helped them along, and they were very frightened of the Ketronians and quite grateful to be leaving. The Algebranian buildings that the Lucido created are still in black and grey smoke. The air is getting toxic, and oh, they're probably full of plastic. I heard an explosion, and we believe that the explosion is very dangerous for everyone. The Vegas had asked us to leave immediately, even though the explosion took place on the other side of the planet. I began to feel that there was an atomic or a very sophisticated bomb that was left by the Aldebaranians, or maybe planted by the Catronians. I, I really wasn't sure what he was saying. Mm -hmm. What will you do? Are you leaving now, or will you go? We will have to escort everyone else off the planet. We are traveling to Satar, which is what we may be referring to as Saturn, a planet close to your star system. Unfortunately, we have to take the Catronians with us, since they had lost their craft a while back while contending with the Aldebranians. Now we see that the Aldebranians took their ship out of spiteful behavior. <laughs> the Vegas said the Catronians would always be close to us or near us until we both learned... This is another start for us and a difficult flight ahead. They will live within our quarters until we get there. Zephron is now tainted with a type of poison in the air and all things are rapidly dying. With the Sleetarin gone and the essentials are packed on our craft, we are planning our trip out. We have a vi acquired another craft from a woman from Vega called Kutra. She came here with a vessel called the Liagos Tamos. It is a more genteel craft for women and less rugged. I will travel with the Catronians on the more rugged craft called the Vector. 
I will keep an eye on them and all of our women, and some of the men will travel in the Liagos. They are also gathering the last crop of food and untainted supplies for our regrowth of vegetation for our stay at Satar. I heard it is a lovely planet and our reward for much of our challenging work. The only difficult part is that we remain the watchers of the Ketronians. They will get to know much about our people this way, and I am burdened that it is my fault that they are still with us. It will be a challenging journey and quite a long time on the vessel. Some will go into hypersleep. I will remain awake along with the rest of the crew. At this point, I began to realize that uh, Sitar was actually Saturn. There is some form of comfort that I will be closer to Samaramis' planet. Yes, obviously, yes. It's, if it's Saturn, then, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Why don't you just travel to get to your locations? Why do you still use... Why do you just time travel to get to your locations? Why do you still use spacecrafts? You don't fully understand matter yet. The time travel is not an appropriate way to integrate time. There are many repercussions to entering space without the properties of matter employed in the function of travel. In your quantum space in molecular travel, there are bits of pieces, bits and pieces of fragments that remain in the original space. Though you are traveling, you remain... Oh, hang on, I just need to shrink this down. I'm, I'm losing the end of the sentence. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, no, no, I've completely lost my space. Um, there we go. Oh, right. Uh, though you are traveling, you remain on the space. That's why many of your time travelers remain in unending loops and unresolved problems, because their primary essence is in the former location. They still remain in that timeline. You never move forward in your reality when you time travel, only halt the activity that ends in an unresolved state. The soul is altered as well quite a bit, particularly if you die during your quest. We only use this method when we are asked by the Vegas to observe. Otherwise, we do not venture there. The lure or enticement to time travel with humanity has many repercussions for your people. There are many unopened doors with unresolved issues. Interesting our conversation, exactly what you were saying. The loss of your presidents was accompanied by time travel incidents such as JFK and Lincoln. Unresolved cases are keys of time travel activity. Jack the Ripper was another. Be wary of strange oddities and altered spaces. I don't want you caught in a loop of these realities again. Then what happens next? We are prepared to embark on our next journey. There is a lake on fire now. It is billowing with smoke. I can't imagine that we were drinking from it earlier. I don't know who or what is setting off this chain reaction of events. The Catronians are standing beside us. I know it is not them. They also seem alarmed. I can see shadow figures that are unrecognizable, like an eerie feeling of invisible beings who have been on this planet along with us. Apparently, they did not want us here and are suddenly making it known. I wonder if they were the original beings of Zephron. I don't have a signal to the Vegas now. It is all so strange. The hidden, ha the hidden ones have form like us. I don't know if they are interdimensional or just masked from us. Everyone has boarded the ship except for me. I have an urge to find out who they are. They are magical in some way. Sparkles and reflections are coming from them. I ask for them to reveal themselves to me. I could see their faces. Strong features with yellow hair and red hair. Some had brown hair with bright green eyes. Their skin was green. Curious. I walked closer and could hear their frequency. It was soft and subtle like the planet was when we first arrived. I was angry to see how we had destroyed their home. They were angry as well. I apologized with great sorrow and offered to help them. Then one, with black hair and crystal gray eyes, nodded and they all disappeared. I wept. What have we done? What have we done? The yellow fumes of toxic air billowed up and I was coughing. The Tsarius watched the entire thing. 
He was as curious as I was. His face was distraught but shouted at me to enter the spacecraft. I suddenly realized the danger I was in and ran to the vehicle and gestured for them to follow. And they shook their heads, no. As I got in, we safely escaped from the planet, but my heart was sick. I looked out of craft and could see them floating. Then a craft left above us. They had been safely transported out by the Vegas. It was the strange beings of Arcturus. I heard about them, and they are somewhat mischievous but not bad in essence. I thought it was unusual that they had been here all along without coming forward. In some ways they too had been influencing our stay on the planet. I'm more curious now and could sense their disappointment. I recognized this feeling the entire time I had settled on Zephron. I'm sure we will encounter them again. I heard that there are many on Aldebron also. I asked the Vegas about them and heard Gupta speak to me. Gupta said, You have come to see beyond yourself and embrace others. Well done, my friend. Now you understand compassion and less self-centered intentions. This is part of your ascension and growth. You will come to learn much more in time. Andronicus asked, Will the Arcturians be safe now? Gupta, no, you are their caretakers as well. You must find them a home where they can live safely. I had asked if they would share Zephron with you and they agreed. Now you must agree to share your homes with them until they find their destination. Are they angry with me? Andronicus Andronic asked. Are they Andronicus? <laughs> Sorry. Again. Yeah. Andronicus. Are they angry with me about destroying their planet even though we didn't do it? It was the Aldebranians, Lucido, Sleetaran, and Contronians who created these chains of events on Zephron as well as Sector 438, as I suspect. Gupta replies, You were left in charge to be the caretaker of the planet. Now it is gone. It was a nourishing home for many. It is not easy to find an agreeable atmosphere for most beings who live throughout this vast, ma bleh, vals, <laughs> vast multiverse. <laughs> it's a verbally tricky one. It is not easy to find an agreeable atmosphere for most beings who live throughout this vast multiverse. A serious, a serious offense is taken from source when we don't value the bounty of what we have. Consider this in the future. It is all lessons of learning. Thank you, replies Danarakas. That means we have more chances to grow. Gupta. Yes, and because of this, your journey with the Ketronians will be the last one. The Arcturians will be the ones you will care for next. I will be light years ahead of you on Satar, preparing the planet with essential sustenance, proper ac atmospheric temperature and development for you to thrive. Without them, nothing will thrive. They are the sacred ones. Thank you, replied Andronicus. We are grateful for all of your help. Then Gupta left the vision and Andronicus continued to stare out into space while the craft departed. Sarius nudged him and, I, and he came back to the present situation and turned to listen. Sarius said, Pay attention to your surroundings. The Ketronians are watching you very carefully. You mustn't appear weak before them. Andronicus just nodded his head and walked into the engine room to prepare for his long trek. I must rest now and focus on how to settle the group at hand. Many of the stations are now filled and the sleeping quarters need to be arranged. Over and out now. We have set our calculations to our next destination called Satar. The Starseed race begins. 88-99-34-62 We are interconnected with love and peace throughout our galaxies and beyond, beyond, beyond. Andronica. <laughs> <laughs> How very interesting. Yeah, yeah, isn't it? I mean, like, you know, I was saying this to you, know, this stuff about from some TV, st TV show, and there you go, and he's talking about almost, you know, some very similar things here. Yeah. 
We had, yeah, you, you hadn't looked at the transmission and I was a little surprised that you were bringing up some similar things that we were planning on talking about, but I'm not surprised. I know that you're right on, you know, kind of on the same wavelength of what needs to be said for right now. Yeah, I think, you know, basically there is a, what they call a zeitgeist, the, the ghost, the, the, the spirit of the time. Um, mm-hmm. and if you're in tune, you speak to different levels of that, um, of that spirit. Right. And there is a spirit that is in the present, and there's a spirit that's just slightly ahead of the present, and there's a spirit that's, you know, just slightly behind the present. And those three are what psychics tune into a lot. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, and there are others that are, uh, you know, like a finer grain um like almost like a light oil or a petrol or something like that that yeah. you get uh, uh, uh a further higher degree of prophecy if you see what i mean like the the higher the the finer the grain the material the more it's like a thought and the longer it takes for that thought to manifest into reality so i've always you know tried to gain my inspiration from this very fine dimension that turns out to be like nine or ten years ahead of time. Right. Like when I'm writing music or something like that, the music that I'm making, like, to me, sounds weird and awkward and bizarre. And then ten years later, this is like everybody's listening to it. It's like normal. <laughs> Very much. Uh, and if, have you seen the film Cloud Atlas yet? Yes, I have. And uh, the guy says, I had this dream and I heard this bizarre music and every, all these women looked the same. And he was looking forward in time at these, uh, this, uh, that sort of Korean, you know, New World Order uh, sort of uh, clone female uh, servers uh, uh-huh. situation. Um, and he heard the music and he then brought the music back. But that was the music that the his student had projected into the future anyway. Oh, it's all <laughs> very complex. So anyway. Yeah, well, that's where the time, the time space seems to skip or we're in the present moment and we're accessing the, the past, present, and future. That's right. Now, um, back to uh, this, um, this, this transmission about what he was saying about time travels. Now, it's very interesting because um, uh, Simon Parks has been speaking about the difference between what he calls extra dimensional and extraterrestrial, uh-huh. and that totally nails what we, you know why there is a distinction. Is that time travelers are messing about and really um, they become unstuck; they get caught in their own loops. Right, and so it's good not to time travel. I think. Yeah, he essentially that's what he was saying, and uh, it's almost like uh, uh, what was the name of that movie, John? Uh, John, John Carter, Carter of Mars. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's what he was saying was reminiscent of that, where there's this like time stamp or a. Uh, a reflection of when you Xerox something. So it's an aspect of you that's going into another time period, but it's not really fully you. And so you're leaving the remnant of who you are behind. And uh, so there's a point where you need to return back to that time space because that's what you're working on. And that where, that's where your soul is identified or where it's supposed to be. And anything other than that will screw you up. So if you think that you can go into time travel and end up somewhere else and, and start your life over there, um, it can't quite happen. And that was the impression that I got. Uh, it's And I've looked at a lot, in, in, and I don't know if people are doing this on purpose, but as I'm thinking about all the different movies that I've watched regarding time travel, it always seems to be that the person isn't quite connected. They can't quite settle in to to the place that they they time travel to. And uh, I, I wrote 
I wrote my book, uh, Macabre, Short Stories and Poems from the Other Side. What's really interesting is, you know, I wrote this book in 2011. And as I'm thinking about all the different things that, that I've had to deal with, uh, spiritually and the things that are happening around us, um, finding that I'm re- reverting back to this book and saying, wow, they were telling me this all along. And, uh, so that this book was channeled, um, it's called, um, Macabre Short Stories and Poems from the Other Side. And then, uh, the, the short stories inside, the one I'm referring to is a story called Rupert. The time traveler, and so he's he's stuck in a uh, you know in his process of time traveling, and he can't because he refuses to deal with his present life, which is he's an unhappily married man. <laughs> his, he doesn't want to be with his wife and doesn't know how to get out, so he finds a way to time travel, and thinking that he can be in all these other affairs, but for some reason he can never quite settle in. And uh, always ends up having to return to the same problem. And I wondered why they, they shared that story with me, and I think it's particularly for that reason. What a brilliant little story. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and very pertinent. And he's from Middle in- England, too, which is, you know, I actually had a vision, and I communicated with him time space. I don't know how I did it, don't ask me. But I saw him sitting on a straw bed in Middle England, or that time period where it's, I don't know, Middle Ages, and and he's just he looks almost Shakespearean in his his clothing. Um, doesn't look like Shakespeare, but you know has long blonde hair and um, is sitting there meditating. And I'm seeing him able to go into time space. I don't know how he did it, but I could hear his wife in the background yelling and complaining. And he was telling me how miserable he was, and so then I wrote the story about him. But, um, <laughs> so, so it's really a kind of um, <laughs> almost like a series of sort of um, sexual fantasies on steroids. Oh yeah, absolutely. But and it's not so, just about sex. Yeah, it's not just about sex. It's about, about sex. getting it's love. About yeah, getting the right love or someone that understands him. You know, it wasn't just like I want to see how many women I could be with because he could have done that there. He was looking for someone special. He was looking for someone that got him, and he didn't realize that karmically he was avoiding, you know, who, who he, what he was supposed to work with with his wife, and then he could have moved on. But people always try to find the short exit, you know, and it says as soon as you realize what the problem is, then you're released, you know, because it's the karma that holds people together, and. uh and then, you know, he might have found that his true love was, you know, maybe on uh, the next village over, you know. Uh, but people don't want to, you know, like you said, they're trying to find another way out. But and, and time travel is very alluring to a lot of people. Not a huge amount of people, but there are people that are you know, quite fascinated and enamored by the idea. And, um, you know, I personally would love to try it. But uh, I do realize that it's the present lifetime that I'm here for. So, I don't know, something to think about. <laughs> Isn't it? And um, the other thing you were talking about, uh, there was a film with Michael Caine and David Bowie as Nikola Tesla uh, mm-hmm. called uh, The Prestige. Uh, oh, yeah. And you know, it was he was a stage magician, but he yes. went along to Tesla because he wanted the prestige, is like the big da da kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's you know, it's a, a, a magician's jargon word for that moment of da da. You know, when you appear, everything you know seems to have been destroyed by whatever's on stage, and there you are. Yeah. Um, Michael Caine describes the, the, the three processes of. And then the the um, prestige is the last one. Yes, it's like the stages yeah. in in the in the um, thing. So, uh, and and by the way, uh, go to Netflix or go to YouTube. See if you can get Doctor Who. Uh, I can't remember which. I'll I'll find the series name and, and number in a minute. Um, but uh, it's it was fantastic. It was a really really good show, um, and kind of about that as well. So. 
you know, there's your man. There's a film called About Time as well. Um, and uh, it's a film about time travel, yet it has no special effects. It's, it's, um, it's the same team who made The Boat That Rocked. Did you ever see that? No, uh, I haven't. Um, oh. Bill Nye and I don't know if you've uh, come across. There are there are an Eng- uh, a British um, uh, actors group who make films like you know the sort the Notting Hill, Paul Weddings okay. and a Funeral kind of group. Uh-huh. They're a sort of similar parallel group to that, and um, often uh, they uh, cross cross breed. But Bill Nye is in a lot of them and. Uh, Various. Anyway, fantastic little film has no violence, no car chases. It's all about you know the guy goes into a cupboard and time travels, um, and uh, is able to go back and live days over and over again and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, the things that he wants to correct or really yeah. enjoy that day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a, a really a really cute little film about time. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. if you want to, if you know, if you wanted to go and watch a movie with somebody that will kind of open their heart, um, and you know, you don't want to have car chases or bangs or explosions or bullets or anything like that. That's the film you want. Really, you know, really recommend. It. Anyway, so there's about time. Well, you know, there might be, you know, a controlled way to do mm. time travel in the future, kind of like with Star Trek. You know, where you're just kind of you know, beaming into a certain time, and, mm. and you know, maybe for the average person, you want to just re-experience, experience that again. Mm. Maybe you know, like I could, I could see the the usefulness of that in the future. You know, where an elderly person wants to go back and just remember their wedding and remember something memorable about their child, their children, or, you know. Mm. A lot of those things are, are you know, you, you can see there would be purpose in it. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So, yes, yeah, a very interesting uh, um, uh, yeah, conversation today. Um I'm trying. I'm trying to make Gupta not sound too Indian, but a little bit Indian. Uh, yeah, you know, I know he's Indian. definitely could be very. He feels like he's very Indian. Oh yes, he, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to make him sound too much like that. Uh, the guy, the guy in, uh, in the <laughs> Simpsons, you know. But he's you know. like he's like this guru. You yeah. know, he's very wise, and and uh, when the Arcturians showed up too, I was a little surprised, but they reminded me of fairies. To be honest with you, really. Yeah, and when you think about the um, Earth energies, the elementals, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's that's what I felt. And the same feeling that you get when you see something happening to the uh, to the trees or the Earth in some way, and and I really think that you can almost just feel the sorrow of these energies, even mm-hmm. here on the planet. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. And, I, I asked. I thought they were the Lemurians at first, and he said they were they were uh, Taurus. And I saw that, and I've seen them before. Um, actually, in one of my children's books, uh, called um, "The Green Stories for Green Cities," and I have all these different little characters. And one of the last characters are called the Sidewalk Jumpers, and uh, they they're just they have all those different you know, unusual colored hair. And they're just, they're kind of watching over, reminding us to take care of, you know, not pollute and, and keep everything clean. But um, same thing. And I didn't know who they were, so it's almost like, and w- when I see these, you know, young generation, 20-year-old kids walking around with really vibrant colored hair. Yeah. You know, I like, can't uh, help but manga. think that they're... Yeah. I can't help but think that they're in, in being influenced by all of this, mm. by these these elementals. Mm. Are, are you um, are you familiar with the like, Japanese? It's called manga. The Japanese um, uh, cartoon, uh, the sort of animations, sort of like uh, animation cartoons. I think I've heard of them, but I'm not sure. 
Um, because uh, you, you know the characters from that sound like these beings that you're talking about. It could with be with the multicolored hair. You know, there's yeah. you see them in you see them in some movies in some particularly like uh, Wachowski movies and things like that. Well, well, the Japanese also are very, very sensitive to. Um, I mean, you wouldn't know what's the stuff that happened there, but for most of the you know the the kami spirits, uh, that the, they're elementals, I believe. So it could be that that's their name for it. They, they believe that there's spirit, energy, and everything. Everything's alive, which is, I believe, is the truth. And so, you know, it doesn't matter what part of the world we're in, that these spirits probably would be prevalent if we're looking for them, if we're sensitive to them and, and have a real affinity for uh, nature. Well, I think, you know, if you know that something's there with great confidence, you can eventually see it. Right. You know, it's like that ship, the old story about the ship and Columbus, you know, you know he looks out uh-huh. there and he can't see it, and then the shaman sees it, and everybody can see it after the shaman sees it. Um, and, you know, this is part of, you know, why we have people who can reach into the unknown and bring back pictures so that everybody can learn to recognize what they are. You know, we didn't know about bacteria until somebody could demonstrate it by a little picture of a bacteria. And then we got the idea of a bacteria. Now everybody can picture bacteria. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we didn't know about viruses. Now we can see viruses. You know, we can see them in our mind's eye very much clearly. Right. Um, And so when you know about different beings we expand our knowledge we expand our experience of who we're sharing the planet with and we used to think oh we're so alone and now <laughs> today we our our world is filled with sprites and um orbs and uh, elementals and fairies and goblins and and you know they're everywhere yeah that we're, you know, they are and we think, you know, that's a block of stone. No, it's not. It's a living creature. You know, we have pet... We used to... Do you remember in the 70s, people? Oh, pet I have rock. a pet rock. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. and it's not that far away. I'm holding a crystal in my hand. That's a pet rock. It's more of a companion. You know, sure I is. don't want to have the relationship of it being my pet. It lives here with me. It's chosen to live here with me. And when it chooses to live somewhere else, it will find its way to cause me to move it, to give it, to move it along. Uh-huh. And that's how they live. That's how they work. And, and, you know, what was interesting is he doesn't really notice them the entire time he's on Zephron. Well, he's, he's, he's got so too much to deal with, with the bloody Slitar and setting fire to things and making a stink. And... uh <laughs> You know, having to be what, wi- and he was anxious. You know, he's anxious all the time with these bloody Catronians there. These bloody Catronians, they get everywhere they do. <laughs> bloody Catronians! Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, this, towards the, well, he did notice though when he first got on the planet that he had this good feeling. And he had this feeling and kind of this uh, vibrational tone that he was picking up it prob- probably had this you know that feeling you get when you're walking through the woods and he w- he noticed it again towards the end and that was the first thing he picked up is they were the sound that he was f- sensing when he first got there <laughs> oh, bless you so uh, he experienced something that he didn't have a word for or an experience for or you know a a previous experience for so he just kind of put it down you know put it in the box saying you know that was an experience and didn't have any any connection with it so these beings are like fourth dimensional yeah yeah they might have been fourth dimension and what was bad is they they were angry because they're supposed to be light hearted still there yeah yeah I st- we still got the feedback though. so you can do, you give it a little yeah, tap there yeah. tap tap you have to do EFT on your uh, hello there we go we're, we're back 
<laughs> you have to do EFT on your headphones. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, I mean, he, he identified it. He said, now I understand what that, that experience was. I understand it. It was them the whole time. They had been hidden. He knew that they were there. He was very, very, very tuned with their presence towards the end. And I think that it's also reminiscent of being more evolved. He grew. He grew from this whole experience of interacting with the lower uh, consciousness beings. And as he grew and started to understand their place, and here, instead of, you know, fighting with the Catronians and leaving them behind, he's very watchful and careful to make sure he takes them on that, on his ship. And I believe, you know, he, um, this is where they begin to, uh, peacefully agree. You know, the Catronians are humble. And they're there on the ship. They have to be transported. And the Alderanians were, you know, the tra- you know, kind of created, you know, the, the, uh, tipping point for the whole planet. And my feeling was that they deliberately had, you know, any evidence burnt down. So the others wouldn't see what was going on. It may have been plastics, but in this case, I felt like it was um, some hidden Maybe nuclear information. Or something. Well, I think the nuclear was to destroy it. You know, after we're finished on a location, on an outpost, we're going to destroy any of the evidence. And I think they asked the Sleet Tyrant to do that. But I think that um, the Vegas knew that the Sleet Tyrant were just manipulated and they were not the masterminds behind it so they escorted them off the planet but I think it was Aldebaran that was primarily the problem there and uh, the Catronians at first they were suspicious that they were involved but he said that um, they looked equally equally startled by the chain of events you know so he knew that it wasn't them and it put his mind at ease that he could put them on his spacecraft and not worry as much about what the outcome would be. So, you know, it's it's very much, you know, similar to any any group of people trying to figure things out. It seems like, you know, they just get into problems, but it's there everything's it seems to happen quickly there. Um you know, it doesn't take a hundred years for them to evolve before they start getting into battles. It seems to be something that happens immediately, where they they're they're already become they are to immediately become territorial and start considering who is around them and uh, the differences in their personalities and, and culture of how things should be done. So. I think that's that's pretty much it for uh, this transmission. That's here yeah, ended the transmission. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's been a very lovely uh, afternoon, Jess. Uh, I'm just trying to find your outro. There you go. Up there. Yeah, yeah. I want to thank everyone, and we'll be back, and maybe I'll have my voice back. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> fixing the yellow submarine that I drive in. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to keep the water. It's supposed to keep the water out, but anyway, it seems to keep the water in. Bless your heart. Um, may you surface well. Um, okay. Maybe I'll put, I'll put slow to surface on in a minute. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, this has been uh, Answers from the Universe. Good night, Jess. Good night. <laughs>